Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Fauna Pfeiffer. You're listening to Fiverr Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. And our artist this week, for the fourth time, I looked that up four times, Gay Ann Rogers. Hi, Gay Ann. Hi, Gary. Hi, Bonna. Wow, four times. Outstanding. Amazing. So, yes. So we're going to talk about, Gay Ann sent me an email a few days ago with an idea for a podcast to talk about stitching in stressful situations and using it as a calming tool and so on and so forth. So that's what we're going to talk about today which is uh, pretty exciting. Um, and actually, Gayanne put this whole show together, so you know we're just along for the <laughs> ride here. <laughs> oh, yeah, blame me. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's all on you, Gayanne, all of it. <laughs> yeah, right. I hope it goes well. <laughs> and we're sponsored by Needle in a Haystack, which is exciting. Uh, first Sunday show for uh, Kathy Ray to sponsor us, Needle in a Haystack. So we're glad to have that. And that uh, needle in a haystack out there in California specializing in hard-to-find needlework supplies, boy, isn't that the truth, and uh, extensive uh, selection of fabrics and threads, cross-stitch, counted thread, uh, books, hand-painted needlework canvases. But the real treasure there is Kathy Ray, the owner, because her ability with threads and colors, mm, yeah, kind of special, yep. Yeah, well, Vonnie, yeah. you had uh, Anasazi's song. Most of those threads weren't available, but mm -hmm. she nailed it right on the head with that. Absolutely perfect. Yeah. Do you think maybe since you say I'm the one who designed this, I would have talked about this even if Kathy Ray weren't sponsoring the program. Probably. You know, she <laughs> is just a wonderful resource in this sense. This is how I've used her from time to time. I get a chart, I get a DMC chart out. I look at a color. Say I want 503 green sorts of colors. I email that number to her and she sends me a selection of threads. I can say things like I want lights and darks and whatever uh, based around 503 and she sends them and yeah. she does a wonderful job. She's one of those that has that ability. That's, uh, that's envious ability there. Yeah. And, and this is a great treasure right now when we're all locked at home. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, because she's one of those that one of the frustrations for a lot of people is like, I, I want to go to the store to actually see the colors and feel the threads or feel the cloth. But she's one of those those few people where she can do the job for you and you don't have to be there. Yeah. Right. Well, and plus that she's probably got some ideas about threads that I, for one, don't even know about. Yes. I found that, too. She said, have you ever tried this? And I say, no, never, but send it along. I think in part, I guess part of what I'd like to say is we're all stuck at home now. We shouldn't go out. At least we Californians shouldn't. Do, do you two? Are you? Are, are they telling you to stay home pretty much? We're, yeah, time? we're quarantined. And, yes. um, but it's not as bad on, you know, where Gary and I, because we're just, you know, next door neighbors on the state wise. And um, it's marching its way towards us. Like we're going to get smushed in the middle between the East Coast. And the right. West Coast. But we don't have that many active cases yet, but um, it's marching its way here. And so, yes, we are not supposed to go out either. So we are really at home. Things are closed down. They have recommended that people, my husband's and my age, stay put at home, period. So if you need a thread, where are you going to get it? Now, I don't know how much Kathy Ray is open now because she's also, I'm in California and she's in California. She's at the other end of the state from me. You know, California is a big place. But if you can do that, then here are a couple of the things I thought about. I thought, write somebody just as a new creative exercise. Write somebody and say, you know, I really like the color purple. What goes with it? What's creative use of it? Put me together four or five threads and send them to me so that I can look at them. I don't know that you're ever going to use them, but it's a wonderful, creative little process. It's one mm -hmm. of my favorite things to do. Mm -hmm. Yep. Have somebody else put them together. You look at them. You may not agree, but it sort of is a mind-expanding thing. And in this day and age, you have time to do it. You're at home anyway. So you <laughs> might as well do something besides just rote stitching and grow a little bit. That's my idea about all this. That's the thing about that is someone else's perspective and it might change yours yeah it's part of the reason for taking classes it's part of the reason for getting together with your friends and stitching is you may know already how to do it but it brings a fresh interpretation to you they may love like i 
think the color that my audience hates the most is orange. They'll use it for Halloween, but otherwise forget it. It was that. So I always think, tell Kathy to do something like take orange and make it work for me. Mm -hmm. By putting it with this and the colors never are isolated. Do you know, it's always dependent on what else is with it. And mm -hmm. it opens up your mind to looking at it and you think, well, okay. And then when you get it, play with the amounts. So squidgy it in your hand with a pinch of orange and maybe a lot of blue green around it or whatever you, she sends you. It's just an, it, it makes your mind grow. And then you look at your canvases and you think, you know, if I tried this, that might be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Let's see what it looks like. And you're home now. You aren't stitching for 20 minutes because you've got to dash somewhere to pick up somebody or fetch something or grocery shop or whatever. <laughs> you can't do that anymore. So you're at home. You might as well let your mind wander on a journey. That's my. That's the whole theme of why I thought of this. Yeah, I can't go to the grocery store. There's no food there. <laughs> <laughs> know anything no. there at least out here actually somebody wrote me today i don't know whether i should say this or not but she wrote me and she said costco has tp <laughs> <laughs> run crack quick. me up <laughs> run quickly you know that's the whole thing about this um environment right now is is i mean people are a little nervous because being, oh, told, being told especially in this country you can't go out but i mean all over the world uh, I follow a cyclist who, in England, who they're allowed to go out one time a day. And, oh. you know, I mean, it's, it's just weird for all of us because we're used to just coming and going as we want to. But that adds a stress. And then you look at the news and, of course, that's all doom and gloom. And then the stock market. And so it adds stress. <laughs> and, and that's what, what we were talking about the other day is is using needlework to to help reduce that stress. And, and it's a powerful tool. I can think of different different ways. What I was doing when we when I was thinking about this program is thinking of different ways in which you can use needlework. So you have a project, you sit down. Let's say that you have a. This is a common thing. You have a painted canvas, right? And somebody's just uh, designed a stitch guide to go with it, so you know what it's going to look like, right? When it's finished, all you do is sit there and rotely stitch it. Try and get away a bit from that. I'm not saying wholly, but just a bit. Pick out a part. Maybe you don't like the stitch. Maybe you think the scale is too big. Go searching for one that suits and try it and see if it works better. You may return to what was suggested originally, but you go, okay, that doesn't work right. Now, why doesn't it work? And what you find is that it's all part of this idea of stitching engrossing you into a certain part and you use your mind and keep it off what's going on in the world that's what happens to i mean i've designed i sat down one day and designed eight projects so i'm working on the first two and i've got the others on i have two sets of stretcher bars i need four more sets of stretcher bars but i can cut the canvas bigger and use another set but the idea was i wanted something really hard so that i couldn't think about anything else i had to concentrate totally on how to do whatever or it was I was doing. I wanted something really easy so that when I was tired from the hard or angry at it, wanted to throw it against the wall, I could pick up and do basket weave for a while. Or I like scotch stitch. Maybe I just want to try scaling scotch stitch to over four, you know, one, two, three, four, three, two, one, or one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 three, four, five, four, three, two, one, and so forth. Does that make sense? I don't know. Well, it does because <laughs> you, when you look at, having multiple projects going and I don't think people look at that as they look at four or five projects that are going that they want to do, but to look at it in a different way in terms of levels of difficulty or levels involvement that they require. And then you pick and choose according to how you feel. Right. You, yeah. And it suits your mood so that if you don't want to so I mean, sometimes something really difficult does just engage your mind and you're excited because you can do it. Other times you think, oh, I'm just doing this terribly. I'm not doing it right now. What's around here that's easier to do that suits my mood better? And I think that's more important today than it ever has been about stitching is it, it, keeping your mind engaged. 
and away from everything. I mean, that's what, isn't meditation, I think that's how this all came up. Isn't meditation really about living in the pre- absolute present, not the past, not the future, not the worry, the regrets from the past, not the worries of the future, but you're living right in this instant. And I think hard, difficult needlework can do that for you. You don't have space in your brain to think about anything else but making this work right now. Yeah. Well, Vana, I don't you know got if that's too much. Vana, you have that uh, Nancy's Needle Project. See, her her designs are are one of my favorites to have in the works because I mean I call that mindless stitching. Yes, that's <laughs> very worthwhile. Yeah. <laughs> very very worth. Wow. I do that with, I have miles and miles. I always do layer stitching. So I often begin with covering a space with 10, 10 stitch basket weave, continental, whatever. And then I, that's my background. It's like putting a wash on the canvas, you know, if you're painting and I get that on, I have miles and miles and miles of it to do so i just sit there and mindlessly do it and then i think my mind wanders and i refresh myself and then finally i'm tired of it so i want to go back to something a little more challenging back and forth back and forth back and forth and it does something that you think oh, oh gosh i've only got a half hour more to do till i finish it i had one of those and then you think oh the beginning a new one that's exciting always exciting it holds all the promise and the dreams. So you put the two together. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and that you can do the same thing. Basket weave or with cross stitch is yes, another one cross- where, you, right. you, yeah, you get a design Big where there's just rows a... of cross stitch. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, just anything that's basic that you do easily, keep that there. And then when you're fed up, do that. When you get bored with doing the easy, go back to the harder. I I recommend for this time a minimum of five projects. And here's the part that I prob- probably people aren't going to agree with me too much about. And that is, if you had a project, is there a design somewhere, maybe it's a painted canvas, and you think, you know, I've always wanted that. I just never wanted to spend the money for it. Now is the time. Reward yourself and get it. It's indulgent, I agree, but it's the time. Order it. And when it comes, then set up, look at it, open it, look at it, Spread it out and go, oh, isn't that wonderful? And yes, I should have bought it. No, I'm not going to feel any guilt that it cost me too much money. And then you say, but I don't get to start it. I don't get to start it until I really, really, really need it, which means I have to do A, B, C, D, and then I can take another look at it. I think that's a it's a risk reward thing kind of. Ooh, that's that's being tough. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think that's a good idea? Maybe not. <laughs> But see, this is great that you said that because uh, in a recent live show, people asked Vaughn and me what, um, how many uh, projects we had in the works, and we were, we were immediately into double digits. So this is a very comforting thing to know that Gay Ann recommends at least five. So that's good. Well, I, <laughs> sometimes you want to get down to two or three. I rarely have this many going. I just thought I needed it right now. I needed to look at this, see, and think, okay, I'll do this for a while i'll do this for a while i'll do this for a while and see how i feel about it as i say i regret it. i don't have four more sets of stretcher bars maybe kathy will send them to me yeah if you ever call, time. i'm sure i'm sure yeah 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 Vaughn and i were talking about basket weave uh just as a thing and and quite frankly i find it boring but uh and i think Vaughn agreed with me but um <laughs> but then you know, but i've had i've had people say to me to do it right, you almost have you have to do it every day for some length of time. Do you do you find it to be a, a rewarding stitch to do? No. Okay. But I find it, the reward for me. I'm willing to suffer through it to get the effect <laughs> I want. That's what it's all about. As I see, I'm doing one right now. I return to it. I thought I'd return to tutor things. I had found an old Tudor design I'd done of Tudor Rose. I put it up on Facebook, and I had stitched it all except for, you know, maybe three hours worth of stitching. And I thought, why didn't I finish this? I'd forgotten I even started it. So I hauled it out, got some thread, and finished it. 
And I thought, oh, good, I'll do some tutor stuff. So I started doing what I do, which is surf online. For I got up all Elizabeth's portraits, all of Henry's portraits, and I was looking and studying the colors. And one of the things that amazed me about the colors is how drab they are. It's the jewelry that brings them to life. It's all the pattern and jewelry on top of basic browns, taupes, you know, non, non-threatening gold, a little sort of rusty stuff some red but not a lot of red that's you know like you don't very often find the whole costume in red it's always and then there's all this tudor jewelry layered on the top of it that's thick gold and stones and it glistens i mean it's a neat exercise to do so i was doing that and i, I don't remember where i was going with this sorry <laughs> Um, and I thought, oh, I'll do a bunch of Tudor designs. So I, that's what I'm working on right now. I finished the Tudor Rose. It was a little, little project I was doing. It was a little Tudor Rose. And I like to make Tudor Roses. They're fun to make. And so I put them on lots of things. And I put them on this new thing I'm working. And But so far, I'm black and a gray-brown and an ecru. So I have mountains. If you think, oh, I know what it was. It was basket weed. I have mountains of basket weave to do. And you know what? It's not even neat shapes. What it is, is it's just long rectangles. So you're not even getting the advantage of going in and out and at least having something change. It's just row after row after row of the same. But I like the finished effect then. You know, it's like, it is like a wash on a painted canvas to me. So I use it. I shouldn't probably say that. But the after, it gives it, well, one of the great advantages of basket weave, can I say this, is you have a background to fill in. I have I began doing it a long time ago, but I began doing it when I was stitching queens. You've got a white a, a, a queen with a pale face. You can't work on a dark canvas. You've yeah. got to have the white. If the face, face is the most important thing in the design. How do you work a dark background behind that face? The only, so you could put together, I mean, you've got this delicate figure all figured out. Now you've got this massive background to fill in and you, it takes three ply of something. You've used one ply in the whole thing. And now you're using a chunky three ply and it's all you see with a great big stale stitch. I have a word about that in a minute. So I thought, what if I basket weave the whole background and then I can do the texture on the top of it with one strand and keep it looking delicate. Hmm. So I like that look so much that I now do it on too much stuff. <laughs> I like I like how it it allows the top stitch. First of all, you don't have to be really particular about doing basket weave the way on my pieces terrifically well because it's just the color you want under there. Paint yeah. doesn't do the same effect. So you just sit in basket weave and if it's got ridges and whatever, you don't worry about it because you're going to cover it all up. And then you do the pattern on the top of it. Some of it you leave open but you don't have to cover it very well because it's the underneath. It's that layer that comes through. I know. Dan, tell- you're the Bob Ross of a uh, needle point. Cause he, <laughs> <laughs> he always put a, a base shade on the bottom. He was the only painter that put a wet base shade on the bottom and then added color after Wait, that. I think most painters, you begin with the back and bring up force. So you don't get to the details to the end. Mm-hmm. And uh, so some of that you do, like I've got one, two, three, four, five, six blocks of, of charcoal basket weave. And I don't know what I'm going to do on them yet. I know they're going to have beads. I know they're going to have some pattern, but I don't know what yet. So yeah. see, that's engaging too. I mean, it's sort of dangerous. It's sort of living on the edge, isn't it? I right. put this block, I don't know where I'm going yet. That's in, me. In, in the context of, of doing this to relax yourself, what do you find more relaxing? Is it the design work or the stitching? They're two different components. Yes. I, I <laughs> yes, stitch. but which is, what is more relaxing to you? <laughs> oh, well, if you, you mean just zoning out and not thinking about anything, yeah. the block's a basket weave. When I'm tired, I just sit that. If I want to listen to the news and I know the news is going to upset me or whatever, I just save my basket weave for then. I stitch to design. I don't design to stitch. I okay. stitch because the stitching gives me the excuse to work on a geometric pattern of designing. It's all for me. It's all about the designing. Okay. I just had a discussion. You know, you know, that's somebody you should have is Melinda Sherbring. She's really easy. She's a really 
interesting person. And she wants to stay. She's a period person. So she says to me, for you, it's all, she said to me one time, it's just all about the design for you or something like that. And I never thought of it. And I said, yeah, it is. It's all about what I can get to, what I can figure out to make it and how do I make it work? That's, that's the part that takes me to another place. And that's the meditative part for me. So do you want me to ask the question that I get asked the most often? I just got asked it two or three times. Okay. People said, how much do you plan ahead? Do you make a detailed sketch and then you do it? Or do you make a partial sketch or do you just pick up the canvas and start stitching? And I said, "Mm, once a year or so, I just pick up a canvas, get out a bunch of threads and start to see what happens. Most of the time, I do a very general drawing that locates, okay, a square's going here, a rectangle's going here, some flowers sketch, sketch, sketch are going here, and squiggle, 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 some black work is going here. I don't know how much yet. I'm not sure that the shape's defined yet. And then I say, okay. Okay, any mini mini mo, where's my focal point is right here, start. So that when I start and get a, quite a lot of the stitching in, I don't know what else I'm going to do. And sometimes this causes troubles. And the troubles to me are the fascinating part. I go, oh no, I boxed myself in now, what am I going to do? That for me, I always say, I who am the coward of all cowards, say that I am Needlepoint's soldier of fortune. I go into battle having no idea where I'm going. I don't want to know. That's the fun. Yeah, that's the that's the entertainment. For, I always say there are two components to needle needle work in general. There's how to do it, right? Up at one, down at two, tension, all those kinds of things. There's how to do it, and there's what to do with it once you know how to do it. And uh, I, if it were how to do it for me only, I'd have been out of there 50 years ago. <laughs> It's the what to do with it once you know, think you know how to do it. So you could give me a dictionary of 10 stitches, and I could stay entertained for 10 years on those 10 stitches. <laughs> I mean, I sometimes would wish for a little bit more, but I just so that when people – this is the thing that fascinates me about my followers. They write to me, and they say – How do I make this perfect? I want to do it exactly stitch by stitch like you did it. And I think, why? I didn't know how I was going to do it till I woke up this morning. (laughs) And thought, well, there's no historical prep. It's just what I felt like doing. If I woke up tomorrow morning, I'd have probably done it entirely differently. So I think, why are you so bothered? First of all, you're never going to be able to do it perfectly because it wasn't perfect to start with. The second thing is, why don't you just be, just try something and see what it looks like. It will engage you. It makes it become more a part of you. I'm not saying you have to look at a blank canvas and start, but every, if I were to design a program for most of my followers who can stitch well, I would say to them, okay, 80% you get to follow my pattern. 20% of it, think of, I don't really like that color and I don't like that stitch. Well, okay, if you don't like that color and you don't like that stitch, what would you like to go in there instead and try it? But, that, but that's no, I, but that's how I can tell this is not doing well here. No, no, it never does because <laughs> it, you get you know you you may at least me you make me think because that's the biggest hurdle I think for a lot of people is you you buy a design you buy a kit and then you immediately set about to replicate it and right. I think for a lot of people they they don't even consider breaking out of what is prescribed and i and then if they do it it's a big wall what what do i do with this pick something and try it and see what happens you can always rip it out and do something else see i don't struggle with that i change stuff all the time see and don't you find bonnie that it belongs to you in a way that it doesn't yeah yeah exactly yeah and then but i'll get a hundred people or more that'll contact me and say I love what you did with that can you send me the chart that you you know whatever you did with so that I can do the same thing you did and I'll do it I'll give them what I did but then it, then I don't feel as special about mine anymore because no. there's a hundred thousand people or not a hundred thousand but you know 50 20 30 40 people that have stitched it the same way as mine as mine and it's a compliment I, that's what i was going to say to you when people email you and say can i want to do it perfect just like you that's a compliment to you because your work is absolutely fantastic 
like. Well, well, thank you, but it's not perfect. I struggle like everybody else. I don't really like it if I don't have to struggle. Yeah. It doesn't, I mean, it's just the way it is for me. If I know what it's going to look like in the end project, I lose interest in, and that's how come it gets thrown in the baskets. Somewhere. Well, and see, I think that with me, I was, um, I would change things, but I was only in my box of cross stitch. That's all I did until about less than a year ago, I guess. And, you know, Gary has like pushed, 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 yeah, pushed. Thank me. you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's opened a whole new world for me but then like when you said a while ago like okay 80 percent that are my, my good stitchers or whatever you know I know that they're good stitchers well I was thinking I don't think I'm a good stitcher see that's my problem is is I don't think when I go to tackle something that I want to try I think oh I'm not good enough to do this you know I'm not I'm not a good enough stitcher to why do why do you think that I don't know. That's probably a lot to do with just my personality, probably, and like, you know, like a personal flaw that I have. <laughs> you but, know, um, let's take the worst case scenario about this, okay? And let's say you're not up to the job. Mm -hmm. Say that you look at this and you think there's no way I can make it. Well, don't throw it in the pile. Don't throw it in the closet. Take it out and say, well, what can I do to it that makes it perfect for me? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the kind of thing I I really like. I really like doing that. I like watching people make decisions that may not be the decisions I'd make, but they're very satisfying to them. I like to look at mine like I'm a trapeze artist, okay? Mm -hmm. And I have soared through the skies on the trapeze, but I wouldn't do it without the safety net underneath me i soar without the safety net but i give you my instructions and they're the safety net you can always return to them but in the meantime why don't you soar a little bit and see if it works you can always open my instruction booklet and try it but let's see what you come up with it it's back to the whole meditative part of needlework without that it's personal for me how mm -hmm. do you get so engaged Mm -hmm. It's a it's a reflection of you, your taste, your ideas, all of that. And who in the world told you you weren't good enough to do it? You know, I look at I've had teach when my was traveling teaching days. People used to I used to get these incredible stitcher students. And Jane Zimmerman walked in one day and she said, "Gan, they're a whole lot better at this than you are." And I said, "I know." <laughs> <laughs> and they were. And they're beautiful stitchers, but they lack the confidence to say, okay, well, now why can't I put this together? And my job is to give you a background. It's to give you the safety net. It, try. I'm trying to make a design that encourages you to try. And once you start trying, you say, you know, I think I could do this here, and I could do that there, and I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. If I could get people to do that, I would be a happy camper. Yeah, it just means I mean, it's I think that people who stitch rotely, see if you agree with me on this, Ivana, I think people who stitch rotely, in other words, they just open the booklet and they go through it without thinking about it. I think they miss a large part of the creative part that makes this fascinating. Oh, I think so, too. I also think that, OK, so I've cross stitched or I've stitched since I was 14 years old and. I never did stop. You know, like you, I hear people say, oh, well, I was away from it for 30 years and mm -hmm. then I came back. I never stopped. I always cross stitch. When I was a young mother, you know, I, I would cross stitch in the evenings. And, you know, as you were talking about, you know, pushing yourself and doing stuff different, I didn't want to do that when I was a young mother because that roteness that just I'm just setting down and making X's, that was like my Calgon moment. You know what I mean? I that was. You know I what I'm saying? I can understand that. Yeah. I can understand. What I would, if you had been in my hands when you were a young moment, mother needing a Calgon moment, I would have said to you, do you know what you do? 99% of the time you do that. 1% mm -hmm. of the time you just venture a little bit out of the box. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, the venturing outside of the box was finishing because I started, you know, oh, yeah. experimenting with finishing and then I got good at that. And and now I'm, I'm on the trapeze and I don't need the safety net or I don't feel like I need the safety net as much. And so I'm, I'm swinging a little bit yeah. on the, yeah, on the trapeze because I don't I need, my kids don't need me as much. 
I think of that over and over again, and I'm up there in the sky soaring around. I look down and I think, oh, no, no safety net. Okay, I'm going to make the safety net for everybody else. But Mm -hmm. that's what it is. It's a starting point. It's trying to get you interested. It's because I used to teach a class in needle point design way back in the dark ages. And I would give people a piece of blank canvas, and one by one, they would just stare at it. And I thought, well, this isn't working at all. (laughs) So I then began to build a slight structure, like making a house. I made the, what are the two by fours that go up and things like that or whatever it is. So I gave them a structure and I said, okay, now you decorate the structure. And then they were okay. Some of them still hesitated. Or if I gave them the whole thing and I said, what do you think of this? And then I don't like that green in there. Okay, well, what would you like in there? Then they could think. And I always thought, it's too bad. I think I stay on this like a broken note because for me, the fascination is what can I do with this? What dream can I do? Of course, it never comes out as well as I hope it will. That's the beginning of it. It's always think, oh, I'm going to make this wonderful thing. I'm going to just love it. And then I think, well, it's okay. It's not as good as I hoped it would be. It's not as bad (laughs) as I feared it might be. It's somewhere in between. Uh, But... I have the next time I can try it again and next (laughs) time it will be better. (laughs) And I don't understand. I, it's such an integral part of needlework for me that I have to tell you, I don't understand why people don't venture out just a little bit. And I, as an ex teacher should be able to get them to do that, but it's a struggle. (laughs) (laughs) We want it perfect. (laughs) The thing is, I think the rating system goes against it, honestly. You know, we go to school, and we get A's if we're really good, and we get F's if we're not good. Most of us are somewhere in between. But, you know, I think I learned this from my husband. My husband used to come home. My husband is a a retired history professor. And he used to come home and tell me, he'd say, oh, I had the most interesting paper today. Doesn't work, doesn't figure out, but it was just a fascinating idea, and the kid really drew it out to such and such. And I said, what? grade did you give him and he said oh an a of course and i said but you said it wouldn't work but he said it's the thought process that was so interesting it engaged me and made my whole hour wonderful mm-hmm. and i thought isn't that they don't give you when you get to a certain point in this it's not about getting the a by pi, by regurgitating what somebody did it's about what spin can you put on it that makes it interesting and that fascinated me that in his world it was the same thing it's all about the creativity of this so Bonnie, i have to tell you can i tell you a cross dish story sure i have friends mine i used to live in england part time and I had a friend there who liked a cross stitch and she, and it was in days before we really shipped a lot of patterns over there. So I would bring her some. So I brought her one of those, oh, it's those beautiful cross stitch patterns that are so intricate. I forget the name of the designer. And she said, I'm not good enough to do this. I said, well, you don't have to worry about it. I said, look, there's leaves there. You don't have to count those leaves perfectly. Just make leaves there. If you've got four, when she had five, so what? Mm-hmm. She got onto that, and she really never looked at the world the same way again. Hmm. I said, you don't have to have it stitch by stitch exactly like the pattern. You need some leaves there. You know, mm-hmm. this, tree, tree, this tree around this cottage has leaves, so put leaves in there. And, you know, she said, you know what? It works. Yeah, there are just leaves in there. I said, you've got her colors. You can mix in other colors. You run out of one. Don't worry about it. Add some other color in there with the leaves. That's kind of what I mean. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. But where where does so, this where does this come from though? Because it seems to me that, I mean, so many people are just they, they want to stick to the the pattern and threads, and is it a function of I finished this? I'm showing my friends, and they want to see the picture on the front of the chart, and then they do a comparison. Uh, is it breaking out of that, or is it uh, or is it something else that that keeps people bottled up like that? Have you ever watched, there used to be a, let me think of what the name of this program was, a runway, Project Runway. Did you ever watch that? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. No. Gary, did you, you no. watch it? <laughs> no. You should watch an episode of it in this sense, because I think it is the best illustration. They have all these kids who are running around making all these clothes, and then they have a runway show of them. In it, and they choose one. It's sort of like the survivor model. And an artist friend of mine told me about it, and I watched it for a while. And this is what I got out of it, was 
the kid who inevitably won was the one who was the most outrageous. In other words, he stepped farthest out of the box. Mm -hmm. And he got the kudos. But we're all afraid of that because our schooling has been so different. Our schooling has been to teach us to be good model citizens, to do this, learn that, and then you can say it on the test and then you get the a and then your parents and your friends are your friends are impressed your parents are happy you get a d because you just thought outside the box in in this class and you it's the shame factor so somebody so imagine this somebody who's done this oh i did that project too but you didn't do that right Mm -hmm. because her, her chart says it should be this way you know there's one universal answer for that yeah, I didn't do it the way she did it. I like the way I did it better. There is no answer to that. No, but, you know, I will say this. Being judged in a, like, a fair, I had, I mean, I, yet, I mean, I've had, like, very highs of, highs of being judged and very lows of lows being judged. But every year, inevitably, and I, I enter a lot of things in the fair, inevitably, I always have one project where the judge goes like last year it it cracked me up because I was like it was a prairie schooler cross stitch ornament that that's what it was and it was a pig and the the judge wrote on my critique paper that it was a beautiful ornament and beautifully finished but she questioned the that I had redone the um the pattern because it just she just didn't think that it looked right underneath the belly and I was like what I I couldn't believe that she you know that's why I didn't get I got a blue that's why I didn't get anything higher because she thought I had redone the pattern well first of all I hadn't redone the pattern but second of all if I did who cares what is it to her if the stitches are beautiful you know laid nicely and the, the tension is correct and the finish is good what does it matter so you even have judges that you know are supposed experts in the field that don't want you to go outside the box. You know what I mean? Yes, but you know what? That's, you know what? I was having suffered the same thing, having been on both sides of it. I judged before, you know, back in the dark ages, I judged a lot and I hated it. Mm -hmm. But I, I, well, I have a story about it, but let me tell you what I think about your judging situation. Mm -hmm. It's her problem, not yours. Right, exactly. She was wrong. She was wrong. So if you didn't get the highest award, so what? What are you going to do with it anyway? Are you are you one of those people who hangs it in the living room of the project? <laughs> no. I, I mean, keep them in a box. I that's think. what I do, and I count them. <laughs> <laughs> I count how many blues. I count how many. No, I you don't. I what? mean. I think a ribbon, ch- I call them ribbon chasers. Uh-huh. And that's what, that's what my friend Arlene told me. She said the re- reason they wanted to be perfect is they're chasing ribbons well, in the fairs true. and yeah. all that. And <laughs> I say, well, what makes them think the judges know what they're doing? I'm not going to be too popular for this. <laughs> but do you know, I could, uh, well, I have about, we, Gary, sometime you should do a show on judging. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, I always think that the judges have the same limitations we all do. And I will tell this story about me as a judge. I have a really good friend. She's been a lifelong stitching friend of mine named Carol Algie Higginbotham. And she is one of those people who's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. She picks, she can do anything with a threaded needle. And she does it perfectly. It doesn't matter what it is. She does it and she does it perfectly. She just got a gift. So she does all this stuff. I do needlepoint by and large. I tinker with needle. I always say, well, it's needlepoint. I just borrow from everybody else and I tinker in various things. But so there were, I didn't know how to do hard donger at the time. And there was this beautiful piece of hard donger and I was one of three judges and I didn't like it. So I didn't give it an award and it cost a huge ruckus. So Carol said to somebody, well, it was Gan who was judging. She didn't know anything about hard donger. How would she know one way or the other? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know, I thought it was a relief because I said, Carol, you're right. Just tell them that. It was true. I was in this show. There was a piece of hard donger. I didn't know anything. I know. I know how to do hard donger now. In fact, I do something that's akin to it. In fact, I, that's what I've been doing that's hard. 
And I didn't know. It was a way, way long time ago. But she was right. So that's what you got to do. You've, you're going to find some people where you're going to judge, where you, you play into their prejudices another time. I always say about judging, I enter shows because it's good publicity and it supports needlework. And I don't really care if I win or not. So I say to people, if you feel bad about you didn't get a ribbon, or you, I say, I've won when I should have. I've won when I shouldn't have. I've lost when I shouldn't have. I've lost when I should have. All those mm-hmm. things. Yeah. And I think that's just the way you have to have to look at it. It's a wonderful way to support needlework, to get it out there, get people engaged mm-hmm. with it and all that. And fairs. I love people who, and I love putting posting on my website people who win ribbons. You know, they get so excited about them. I think, what are you going to do with them? I bring them home. I throw them away. <laughs> I keep <laughs> some of them. <laughs> No, I do not. I have one framed. As a matter of fact, I have two framed, but I don't have them on the wall. I just have them down where I, you know, in my cave. But I, I, that's why I do it is because I went to the fair, oh, 14 years ago. I always have gone to the fair because that's like a thing that you do in Indiana. Right. And um, I went to the fair one year and there was like maybe five needlework things. And I, and it wasn't like needle, it was like, they had needlework as crochet knitting and you know thread and needle right. needlework and I was like shocked and I thought you know I'm gonna I'm gonna enter so I found out how you can enter as an adult and yada yada and I started doing it you know as I started doing it there was more people that would recognize my name because they'd put your name by your piece right and you know, oh you I didn't know that you did that and I was like yeah yeah and you ought to do it too and it's so fun and I've gotten several people just here in my local area that you know have talked to me about cross stitch and i think has even crossed you know has started needlework of some kind and that's why i do it but then once you do it i'm going to be honest i'm very competitive and and i i mean i really am and once i it was my like a fever in my blood that i was going to get grand champion of needlepoint come (laughs) hell or high water i was going to get it right (laughs) and so i did finally i did and then I got um, reserve grand champion last summer. So um, I, you know, that's just one of my things that, that I, I don't know that this sounds so self-centered and I don't mean it like this, but I want to like leave, I want to do something really good in my life. You know, I want to be good at something. I went to college. I didn't get to have a career because I had four kids. Right. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, Takes enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to like leave this world with like, somebody saying you know she was the best at something and I would like to be known as the best at needlework I guess I I want you know what a wide range of repertoire she was and boy she was really good at this and can we just just tinker with that for a minute why don't you say she was really good and really adventuresome at this and we love looking at her things. You don't have to be the best. You, you're you never going to be the best. There's always going to be somebody better. That's yeah, the way it is. Yeah, you're right. But if you're, she, I can understand wanting to leave a legacy. Of, uh, she was really good at this. She was outstanding at it. She was one of these people who could just, like I said, wouldn't you like the legacy of what I just said about Carol Algie Higginbotham? Oh, yeah. Where she could just do anything with a threaded needle. Right. And I think, do you know, that's exactly, I think it's nice to leave your mark, but Mm -hmm. I think you should look at it like, what did you leave your mark doing? What was it that you wanted to express that you did a certain technique that you tried out of the box that define what you mean instead of just the free floating. She was the best. Mm. How do you like that for being a little heavy? That is heavy. And I mean, the, I think that I think that I am trying to do that, really, to be honest with you, because I have really broken out of my mold here in the last, you know, nine, ten months. And it's and fun, huh? It is fun. And I mean, it's just like, you know, like the fever that I had to be, you know, get the grand champion at the fair is the same kind of fever that I feel about trying a, a different, harder, newer, different technique, harder project, right. whatever. And um, being well, you know, doing that well and the best that I can 
be doing that. And no, will I ever be known as the best? No, I won't. But I do hope that somebody someday says something as nice as what you said about your friend, <laughs> because I that know. would just be genuinely lovely if somebody would say something nice like that and, and genuinely mean it. That would be great. So. I think they, they obviously will. I mean, there's no problem with that. They will. Yeah, I hope. And the more you do of it and the better you get at it, I would like to be somebody, if I had a legacy, I would like to have this legacy. Look at what she did. Look at what she experimented on. And look at how she grew. Mm -hmm. So that I look at my old things and think, well, they're, you know, I got better at that, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but I like those because they show where my journey is. Right. And I think that's that's I think that's really important for for the whole. I would like needlework to be creative, where people try things. Like Gary, you were telling me yesterday about Trish Burr. Yes, yes. I would like to see those things that she wanted to do. Yeah, no, I, I, that's one of my favorite stories. When when uh, I don't know if it's in the show or or after uh, that we were talking, but she talked about how. She was was just going to what was she shut down. She shut down her her uh, shop because it was just consuming way too much time, and she did this some time ago. And she still does patterns and sells them, but uh, it was all the threads and other things. And she was just spending hours and hours and wasn't seeing her family. But also, it was there's a, a level of needlework design and stitching that she wanted to do that she didn't think anybody would care for that. No, it would, you know, it wouldn't be any interest in it, but it was, it was a level that she wanted to try. Right. And, and so she was going to go do that. And I thought, Oh, I'll bet, I'll bet the end result of that is, and I think I even said it to her that she'll find a group of people, probably a large group who will love that. Give, right. you know, given the chance to see it and see what can be done. will jump on that. As much as we all admire her uh, needle painted uh, flowers and birds, which are amazing in their own right, that and, and then she went off and and I, I, the things that I saw that came out of that, uh, some landscape uh, uh, pieces were spectacular. And I when I looked at them, I was like, why would people not want to do that or not want to see that? In terms of hey, I want to do that same kind of stitching. And, uh, and so I, I keep watching her work to see what else she does in the context of, I'm just going to go off on my own and do what I want. Uh, cause I don't know, I think some designers get stuck in that rut of, well, this is sold, this sells, these designs sell. So I'll do more of those. And it, if you're building a business, that's what you do. Yeah. But at some point, you you just go wait. I, I I'm I've done enough of these. I, I want to go do something right. else. I don't know that I would have done that, Gary, without you saying, you know, pushing me. I don't know that I would have gone outside of cross stitch. I'm serious. And with you like pushing me, that made and you know kind of like egging me on. You know, <laughs> that was like, you know, and you did because I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Every time you'd say stuff, I'd be like, mm, nah, you know, I'm not doing that. But boy, I'm so glad that you did because it's like open, like I said, over and over, it's opened a whole new world for me. And I wish that other people would that listen to us or don't listen to us or listen to us infrequently. I wish other people would see how wonderful it is to step out of of just you know whatever you're in doing. If you only crochet, well, try knitting. If you only cross stitch, try you know needlepoint whatever and it's just so it's just so rejuvenating and and just makes a fire burn underneath you and i i wish other people would, would do that so I, i'm glad we started talking about this because i hope that this rejuvenates a whole bunch of people and now that they have time on their hands to look into other things because i think that's largely you go back to you're busy you're busy you're busy the lord knows that there is not hardly very many people busier on the face of the earth than what I am. <laughs> and I keep on trying to get less busy and it seems I get more busy. But anyways, when you have a few, you go back to what, when you're that busy, you go back to what is comfortable, right? What, you know, 
kind of like what I said when I was a young mother, I, you know, I only cross stitch because that was like my Calgon moment. You go back to what's comfortable. It's, it's hard to get, go into something that you're not comfortable with. That's like danger, danger, danger. You know, that's what your brain tells you. And, and um, that's what I was telling myself when I started cross stitching that queen sampler. I thought, what in the world did I let Gary talk me into? This is crazy. <laughs> this is crazy pants. You know, <laughs> and, and you did it. Yeah. And I started doing it and it's like fantastic, you know, and it's just like, I keep, I can't like last night I couldn't even sleep good because I talked to Gary for an hour on a podcast. Then I was talked to him again in the evening where we stitched. I dreamt all night long about needlepoint all night long about <laughs> Jessica stitches and walnettos and how, what color and this and that. And I woke up this morning and Keith goes, Oh, did you sleep good? No, I didn't. Why not? Well, because I was, I was needle pointing all night long <laughs> because I have this time and a little bit of time where I can think and look about stuff at stuff. So I hope people use this time to like fill themselves up with something that they can like chase, you know, that something that they can chase and try out and, and rejuvenate themselves with, you know, and, that, and, and back to the theme of what this program sort of strayed from, but it, I hope it was a good stray is using the time to keep your mind off what's going on, on mm -hmm. in the world away from it for a while. If you try a little adventure, even if it doesn't work out, you can look back on it and see, and maybe it will work out. Mm -hmm. But you could say if it doesn't come out quite as well as you think, you think, you know what, it passed that time with me doing something new and adventuresome and it took my mind off the woes of the world. And what if it died? We say to people, well, what's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to have to rip out something. I've said to countless people at times, they tell me, you want me to rip out those three rows? And I say, you are one big wuss. I ripped out half a canvas before and many times yeah. because it was easier. I had the choice between starting over or ripping out the half of it and ripping out the half of it looked like it was the better option at the time because I'd done A, B, and C the way I wanted them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just the, that's the price of getting to the goal. So I always say to people who ask me a for, formula, I may have said this on one of the other times. If I did, forgive me. You know, I can give you a formula that will get you to, okay, does this go with this? Use this, this, and this together, and then it'll be okay. Pick a dark one, pick a light one, pick a whatever, and it'll work. But you only get, you know, wonderful is only serendipity. It only comes to you if you try and try and try and work the magic right there in the here and now. So my husband has a saying that is the worst saying I know. It's haunted me ever since we've been married. And that is the better is the enemy of the good. The yeah, better that, is the enemy of the yeah, good. That's, that's good, my favorite. Yeah. That's my favorite. Yep. And it, if never any truer than this, so that if I took a chance and I tried this, so it wouldn't work out. So it, this is probably my favorite story from my needlework teaching days. Somebody said to me, Does, can I use this chronic bread, braid with this color silk? And I said, beats me, try it and see. And she said to me, what do you mean? You're the teacher, you're supposed to know. And my answer for years and years and years was, if the immortal artists of the Western world didn't know, how would I, mere needlework teacher, mere mortal needlework teacher, know? That's always been my answer till somebody put her hands on her hips and said to me one time, how do you know they didn't know? And I thought, you know what? I didn't answer. I just said game's over and I never used it again. I thought, how could you not know that? Where have you been? But <laughs> that's life. <laughs> so that's, I think that comes from experimenting. I don't know whether it's going to work. If you don't know whether it's going to work, try it. All you're going to do is get a seam ripper. Get one from Kathy Ray. Get a half dozen of those little bone seam rippers, and your work goes. Hat you get. It takes a while to get used to them, but once you get used to them, you can rip in a quarter of the time. That's hmm. the tool I need. <laughs> well, I ripped out a whole queen sampler, or well, four bands of a queen sampler. Well, there started you have over. And did it get better? It got fabulous, but I can't tell you. You know, I have a. I have people that follow me. And I cannot tell you, it was like split down the middle. Half the people were like applauding that I did it because mm -hmm. I was that brave to do it. And half the people were like criticizing that Why? I did it because they thought I was trying to be a perfectionist. 
the answer to that is it didn't look the way I wanted it to look. That, that's exactly that's what right. the answer. Yeah, that's exactly the answer that I gave. It oh. didn't. I wasn't happy with it. I it it didn't. You know, I knew. Yeah, it looked okay. Yeah, it looked all right. But in my heart, I knew that it wasn't right. You know, and I wasn't going to be happy. I wasn't going to. That was going to ruin that project for me if I didn't do what I did. Well, then and you I, don't even need them to answer you. The answer oh, no. Rip. Yeah, I ripped it. I didn't even tell anybody. I was, I, well, I, I did tell Gary. He knew I was. And I was going to. And um, I ripped it all out. I washed the can. I washed the linen. I restarted. And it's better. It's perfect now. Because I had more confidence in what I was doing. I knew where I went wrong before. And I strove to not go wrong in those areas. And it went better. Now I'm to the same sticking point where I was when it started all going wrong. And I'm a little hesitant about moving forward <laughs> because of this, you know, one stitch that I have to do next. But I'll get over it. You know, I'll, I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll beat it. And, and that's because nothing's going to beat me on this. And that's what I keep on telling myself, you know. I'm just, I'm going to win eventually. I might have to, I might have to, you know, take it out. I might have to try, try again, but I'm, I'm going to, in the end, I'm going to win. And I think that if people go in with that kind of idea, then how, who's going to defeat you? The only person that's going to defeat you is yourself. You're right. And so, you know, that's the way I've been, that's what's taught me. I, me doing this swinging on the trapeze, that's what it has taught me. That the only person that is going to defeat me is me. And I'm not going to defeat me because I'm going to win eventually. You know, I'm not going to let myself be defeated. So anyways. You can get a doodle canvas or a doodle piece of linen when you buy something, get an extra piece of it and practice on that. Yeah, I, I do. Routine. I do. And it's and I get one looking really great on the doodle. And then I go to the real thing and then I fudge. Up. <laughs> but I haven't tried it's the second time around. So I'm going to go in with a better, you know, I'm going to do this and I'll get it done. And it'll happen because all of it has happened. You know what I mean? We've just, Gary and I have a really hard time about staying focused on one thing. And so that's I why you have five or six projects going. And that's so right. That doesn't happen. And then you get in the mood and you think, oh, like, uh, if I were in your shoes with this project where you just started over again, mm -hmm. I would get to the point where you are now, leave it for a little while, go do some something that's more routine and mm -hmm. then come back to it wait one day you'll wake up and say oh I'm in the mood to tackle that yeah yeah and I'm kind of feeling like that anyways and so yeah I I've got this one thing that I, is very close to being finished right I'm going to finish that and then I'm going to go back to it right so yeah it'll work it'll happen it will I don't know how much time Gary how much time have we been well we've been an hour but that's okay I've enjoyed listening to you guys thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> Terrific show, Gay Ann. You put together a good one. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. Don't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Better better is the enemy of the good. That's, um, that's yeah, our... That, I yeah. hate that saying because it's so true. Yes. <laughs> better right. is always the enemy of the good. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Gay Ann. Thanks to Kathy Ray and Needle in a Haystack for sponsoring. And thanks to everybody for listening. <laughs> <laughs>